and the scary part about this specific scenario was we we uh, we were coming down and then we poked out of the cloud and I, I'm looking out the back and I just see a cactus whip right by the back and I'm like oh god oh god power 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 I call and that's like the that's the call that no one wants to hear power 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 yeah, and yeah. the pilots are like just, you can you can hear powers in powers in and you hear <laughs> like they're like TCL over travel goes in and that's where like the the TCL is the thrust control it's that's the power on the plane that thing pushes all the way forward and then you can press a button and it allows you to go a little bit further right just a, just a hair um full power in and we're, we ended up actually touching down doing 20 knots drift 20 knots wow, to the left, we wow. Down, and we're just like just grinding on the ground and then finally power up out of it Welcome to another episode of the Military Bottom Line Podcast, where we help you make the most out of your military contract. Today on the show, I have my friend Josh Zeke. After five years in the Marine Corps as a V-22 Osprey crew chief, he has transitioned into the Army because he found the quickest avenue of flying in the military that does not require a bachelor's degree. If you guys are interested in the aviation uh, career path, or really just different uh, military opportunities in general. He's got a lot of good in- insight, and uh, he's got kind of found a little bit of a loophole in order to fly in the military without needing to go through four years of college to get there. I hope you guys enjoy the show. If you do, consider subscribing and follow me at Military Bottom Line on Instagram for more. Hey, man. Hey. Can How you, hear you me? doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I want to start off by kind of like, I, I met you a couple of years into your Marine Corps time, but I want to hear like, where are you from? Why do you join? Uh, why, why the Marine Corps of all branches and, and kind of a little bit about your military experience thus far. Okay. So I, let's see, I starting at the beginning. So I wanted, I wanted to go into the military and, and specifically the Marine Corps because I wanted to do something um that was out in the front kind of thing like i wanted i wanted to be more um on the front line being the expeditionary force kind of thing like where you're always the the tip of the spear kind of thing right and so the marine corps seemed like that was where it was at like and it was always it was also a like hey do you think you have what it takes they got me with that one mm, they, always, they always get people with that one <laughs> yeah so uh, i had what it took and so yeah but i wanted to i wanted to do that so I started out my time back in 2015 uh, with uh, specifically like when I, when I first talked to a recruiter about it, um, I went in and was like, hey, I want, because I had already done my research. And that was one thing I, I would tell people is like, hey, look stuff up online, mm-hmm. like figure out what you want before you even walk through the door, because they're going to sell you the second you walk through the door. So mm-hmm. don't go until you have some research done prior to. So I walked through the door already with a job in mind. And all I was there to do was get answers on that job specifically that was it hmm, so smart. i walked through the door and then talked with the uh one of the guys he's a b22 guy surprisingly which is kind of weird but i talked with him and he was like hey uh yeah so air crew um that's what i wanted to do was ag or air crew um and he was like yeah so i don't have any like an air crew spot for you um but we can you know there's other things there's a you know eod there's recon. You want to do recon? I was like, no, man, I don't, <laughs> I want to do air crew. And I'll like, I like no offense, but like, I, I'm not going to go anywhere with this until like, you can give me an air crew contract. And he was like, okay, man, well, like, I, I, don't, I can't give you anything. You, like, so he, I just depth in, I depth in and it was in a holding holding for like mm. seven months before I even got a contract. So I just hung out. So go ahead. explain why, like, why does it take seven months? And like, why was he saying, I don't have that for you? How, how does that work? Just because they didn't like, they have a certain quota of like, Hey, we only need out of our RSS or recruiting, recruiting substation out of our RSS, we can only send, you know, one AG per month. And we already have three guys lined up. Gotcha. So the next three months. And then like, we don't know if another, like if another spot's going to open up three months from now. Mm, you know, okay. so they, he's like, realistically, I, I'm being straight up with you. I can't promise you anything. Cause like, I only see a database and the database doesn't allow me to. So like, <laughs> do you want to do it? And you know, do you want to do recon? Like, <laughs> so yeah. they just like, they give you the jobs that are open or they, they try to sell the jobs that are open. And I wasn't like, I was there to get AG and that was it. 
Um, so he ended up, he was, he was really cool. Like he wasn't really like pushy, like most recruiters. Cause I was just straight up with him. I, he wouldn't, he knew I wasn't going to budge and yeah. he, he could have told me to like leave. I just like, you know, Hey, we're not, you're not going to work with us. Um, but he was willing to work with me and he mm-hmm. let me hang out for, uh, seven months until I, I got the job. And then, um, I went, uh, went through boot camp. That was, um, good time. <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, and then right after boot camp, uh, we do MCT Marine uh, combat training. Yep. Uh, and that's, so let me back up. Boot camp was out in, uh, uh MCRD San Diego there in S- Southern California. Um, right next to like, right next to the airport. Like you suck down jet exhaust when you do your PFT, like, you know, uh, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's oddly downtown. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sucks. Um, but anyway, we so I did that, and then MCT uh, is just north of there. Um, uh, we went back for ten days of leave right after boot camp. Came back, did MCT, um, and then uh, got on a flight down to Pensacola. Or I uh, excuse me, uh, actually, I'm trying to remember now. Yeah, Pensacola. Uh, went down to Pensacola, did uh, air crew candidate school, um, and that was just like a a haze fest, man, like a pool haze fest. You, you just been candidate school. So this is like before you had an actual guarantee spot as a no. air crew. Yeah. So you are, well, you, so you already have a contract as an, an air crew man, like you already have a G or air yeah. crew. Um, and then you, to be able to do like actually, cause you're still a candidate all the way up until you graduate candidate school. And then now you are a air crew, like you're an air crewman that's non designated. Gotcha. So then, then you have to go through uh, and get like a- at the end of candidate school, that's when they give you a platform. Then you're like, Hey, now you're Hueys. Now you're this, now you're, uh, you know, 53s. Um, now you're C one thirties. So like everyone, everyone's like uh, at that point, that's when everyone's like, Oh, I really hope I get what I want. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up with V 22s. It was not my first pick. Like I put down Hueys and then I, the guy was actually kind of mad at me because I put Huey, 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 one, two, three. So, <laughs> uh, but I ended up with B-22s. Um, and thank the Lord I did not get Hueys because those guys hate their life. Uh, <laughs> they really do. Like, we're working alongside of them on the flight line, man, I, I have a couple good friends that are Huey guys. And, man, they hate it. Like, they like, like, initially, like the first two years of your life, like active on the line, really trudging away, learning the, learning the plane, like, man they they hated it it was, mm-hmm. it was really hard um but anyway uh so we ended up with v22s uh the out v22s of, the the tilt rotor they kind of they go from helicopter to airplane essentially just to correct yeah yeah so it so it, it's a vertical takeoff helicopter or airplane uh, tilt rotor it's a vertical takeoff tilt rotor aircraft um that it's more of a turboprop plane than it is a helicopter mm. Uh, it's that's the way I, I think of it is like it's more of a turboprop that can land vertically than the other way around it's not it's not very helicopter oriented like it can do it but that's not it's that's not its bread and butter it's bread and butter is being a plane gotcha. so uh, and that's it, it can do it can do all that vertical stuff but that's not really it's it's main point okay uh, anyway so we then went up from uh Pensacola, we went up to Maine and did uh, Sear in November, which was really, that was cold, man. It was, <laughs> yeah. Give, give us a little bit of insight on Sear. What Seer. is it and why do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Sear, so I think it's survival, evasion, resistance, escape uh, training. And it is a, uh, it's a school that you go to when you're a crew member on an, on an aircraft or you're in a high probability MOS for being captured or like when you're forward deployed. So like MARSOC, SEALs, EOD, um, Intel, a lot of those guys are going to go through along with us. And we, we had an EOD guy and uh, two Intel guys go with the, with us. And those Intel guys are, they're weird. I, yeah, they, 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 those are the weird guys. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so you go through uh, SEER and, it, and the point of SEER is to really just help help equip you in a in an environment where you are in a potential like in a place where you have been separated from your regular crew um so in like a crash or uh 
a forced landing behind enemy lines and or like you fall out the back or you get left. I don't know. There's, so we're, we're always operating potentially in a foreign hostile environment. So right. that's why we went as crew members. Um, but yeah, so you, you're given a lot of techniques and a lot of uh, information on being able to operate in that environment. And I'll leave it at that. I, yeah. If you, if you want to go do it, find a job that allows you to go to see her and <laughs> enjoy the fun, you know? Um, but uh let's see so we went through sierra in maine uh in november and it was we had just gotten like two feet of snow on the ground um and man it was it was ooh, it was rough yeah maine yeah. get maine gets pretty chilly up there i know that yeah and the crappy part was it would it would like melt on you so like mm. it, it snowed two inches and it melted and then it would snow another inch the next day but like through the day it would warm up to get all wet so your pack and everything's all soaking wet. And then you go into that night, you wake up the next morning, your pack is literally frozen solid. Mm. Um, and your boots are all, yeah, dude, it, it was, it was rough. Yeah. Uh, learned a lot though. Learned a lot of really, I would say it's one of the best schools I've ever been through. Hmm. Um, and because of that, now the job that I'm in now, um, I don't have to go through it again. Thank the Lord. Cool. So, yeah. Um, so did Maine, um, and then you go down to North Carolina to do uh, mechanic school for the V-22. And then uh, that's about a three-month, three- or four-month school of um, – So as an air crewman, you're basically uh, – you're a mechanic, in your case, for the V-22 Osprey. Yeah. But you're like a flying mechanic. So if anything goes wrong while in flight, it's your job to fix it, essentially? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't – so don't think I, I wouldn't think of it like that. I would think of it more of as you're a mechanic who is on the plane because you're not really realistically. I'm not going to fix anything in flight. Like, okay. you're, like if the plane's broke, the plane's broke. I'm not going to get out <laughs> and sell and like turn wrenches on it. You know, like if it, but your ability, like bringing your brain along with the crew mm -hmm. and your expertise and your uh, experience, you're able to advise. The biggest thing that a crew member like in the back does is advice like you're so like as a pilot up front you would be able to lean on the experience and the information from the guys in the back hey i've got this ep up here you know emergency procedure i got this emergency procedure it's saying hey your nacelle is going to fall off what's your experience okay yeah the nacelle could fall off like you know <laughs> like it's that kind of thing but then there's some small stuff where it's like hey this specific small thing on the plane what do you know about it and that's where a lot of our training comes out and hey you have to be well versed you have to have like done your research you have to keep up with the publications and yeah. you have to like you have to really know your thing um and know your craft which you know good good crew chiefs uh can just riddle off pubs yeah. after pubs man like they're just a walking dialogue like hmm. like a dictionary of just bleh, they just throw up on you with all this information and it's awesome um I was at a thousand hours when I left and I felt like I was just chipping wow. away. I felt like I was just chipping away at like just the, the edge of the iceberg on, huh. on the V22, man. Like there is so much experience to be had. Uh, and that's why like one pilot who goes through, you know, 250 hours, you can, you can be attacked a guy in charge of the plane at 300 hours. So um, it, it's just like, you could have a 300 hour guy who's actually the one in charge. He's the one wiggling the sticks, right? Yeah. But you've got a guy in the back who's got 2,000, 3,000 hours worth of experience. And, you know, that's where, like, you, you can lean on your guys in the back. And that's why, like, you're not really a mechanic who's going to do something in flight. You're really yeah. there to help help the crew as a team. And that's gotcha. a big thing that I, I don't know, I, I like about the V-22 and I like about, you know, bigger planes like that. And that it's a crew mentality, not just, you know. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Rah, single single seat fighter i don't know yeah 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 and and as a a crewman you're also working i mean you're like yeah you, you, you wear a lot of hats from what i understand you're a door gunner when that's necessary uh yeah. you're basically responsible for any pa <clears throat> any passengers that you guys are bringing along yeah, so or any the, cargo the contract that you have with with the pilots and this is was at our unit i would say across the board at least for the marine corps aviation is like the crew chiefs own the back and you carry the weight or the rank of the soldier, like the, the, the pilot up front. So if he's a major, I carry the weight of a major in the back. And if somebody's gotcha. giving me a lift about something, then it's like, Hey, go talk to the guy up front. Like, yeah. like 
you know, it, it just, it, that's the way it is. And if you talk to him, he's going to tell you, what did the crew chief tell you? If the tr- crew chief told you to shut up and sit down, shut up and sit down. Like, yeah, that's yeah. Just, it's kind of cool in that, like, you're, and there's a lot of responsibility with that, too. Yeah. With, like, that guy up front is trusting me to keep the entire back of the plane squared away. And when I tell him something's the way it is, it has to be that way. Like, yeah. I told him it's good to go. It has to be good to go because he's, he's trusting the back of the plane is taken care of. For so sure. There's, there's a lot of responsibility put on crew chiefs, and especially at a very young age. I mean, I was 19, um, uh, 19 and a half when I was first, like, put in, in charge of the entire back of the plane. And that's, like, when you're the guy, the one that's like, hey, thumbs up, everything back here is good to go. Like, that's a big, that's a big responsibility. Like, yeah. Yeah. On a, you know, $83 million plane. And I'm, and, I, and on top of that, it's people's lives. Like there's 20 people back there. Like, Hey, yeah. they're all buckled in and good to go. Like, yeah. So yeah. I, it matters. It matters yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, so. You have any, uh, any hairy, hairy flight stories that you want to share? Oh my gosh, dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we had, uh, so what, my specific unit was, uh, VMM 164, uh, out in, uh, Camp Pendleton, California. Um, and we were one of the last V-22 squadrons to transfer from the CH-46 to the V-22. And the CH-46 is a old, or they call it the frog. It's the old Marine Corps, uh, helicopter that they used for everything. This, like, it was the main Marine Corps get around kind of thing, right? Um, but then they're phasing it out for the V-22. So the 164 was the last squadron to do it. Um, and there was a lot of 46 pilots who had transitioned from the 46 to the V-22. So you got a lot of old, like crusty majors and lieutenant colonels who are like, you know, I flew frogs for like 15 years and they're just like real crusty. Yeah. And they have a lot of tendencies for being a helicopter guy this whole mm-hmm. time. And now they're flying a V-22. So it's just way different. It's just super, yeah. super different. So you have all these pilots who have a lot of, they're a ton of really experienced pilots, but they're not V-22 pilots. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, you know, frog guys. So I was flying with a, a major and I'll leave his name out of it, but I was flying with a major who, who was a transition guy and he was just, I don't know. He, he was more confident than I think he needed to be. I mm-hmm. think he could have been a little more humble. We ended up going to an LZ that was really, really dusty. Like we're talking like at 150 feet, not that's that's pretty high for an, for a landing to start kicking up dust at yeah. 150 feet you just start you start getting in the goo like the, the dust starts coming up around you that's not yeah. normal like that's really bad huh. uh at 150 and then at 100 feet you're already in the cloud you can't and, see, you can't see the you can't, ground you, you have no see, idea you yeah you're already you're out like and the, uh, the cadence for that like the way that it would normally happen the pilots would be like hey calls in the back um and then we would start calling it in um, but then the guy in the front's the one who's calling it and he'd be like, Hey, you're at, you know, hundred feet, you're at 50. They, they'd normally start calling at 50 feet. Uh, but when you start, when you start getting in the cloud that early, then it's just like, Hey, calls in the back. We can't like, we're already in it. Uh, yeah. so then it'd be like, Hey, Brown out in the tunnel, Brown out in the ramp. Okay. Calls left seat. And the guy on the left seat would just start calling it. He's like, okay, you're at hundred feet. You're at 75 feet. You're at 70. Like just calling it down off the screen because that's you're going off the rad out the radar altimeter it's yeah. pinging down to the ground and back up and that's yeah. all you can see so you're just everyone's like holding on to their pants like just like uh, it, you're in like significant danger of having a hard landing at that point I, oh for sure like yeah and and worse than that is the drift because mm. it, it's okay you can take a hard hit coming straight down mm. you take the hit coming to the left or the right um and the scary part about this specific scenario was we we uh we were coming down and then we poked out of the cloud and I, I'm looking out the back and I just see a cactus whip right by the back. And I'm like, Oh God, Oh God, power, power, power. I call it, And that's like the, that's the call that no one wants to hear. Power, power, power. Yeah, and that's, yeah. The pilots are like, you can, you can hear them, powers in powers in. And you're <laughs> like, they're like TCL over travel goes in. And that's where like the, the TCL is the thrust control. It's that's the power on the plane. That thing pushes all the way forward. And then you can press a button and it allows you to go a little bit further, right? Just a, just a hair. Um, full power in. And we're, we ended up actually touching down doing 20 knots drift. 20 knots. Wow. Left, we wow. Touched down and we're just like just grinding on the ground and then finally power up out of it. And man, it was, ooh, it was, it, 
I, I think I cleaned out my pants. Like it was bad. <laughs> Man. So yeah, if, if you hadn't made that call, then you, you would have been sliding to the left, hit ground and could, it could have tilted basically and hit, hit yeah. rotors. Yeah. You, we could have, we could have like definitely flipped that thing. Like it could have happened. Like, Sketch. or we could hit something or, 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 or man, like, um, yeah, it was, that was not, that was not intended. Yeah. Um, they did a really good job though about owning up to it. I, yeah. I, I take my hat off to him. Like he, he was like, Hey guys, like, I really, I really screwed this out. I apologize. Like we, we took it, we took a little too hard. Um, and man, like that's the thing about aviation though. And like working as a team is like, we were able to hold them accountable to it. Like as soon yeah. as that happened, it was like, Nope, we're done. Like we're going home. Um, we, but yeah, we ended up knocking the tire off. Like it it didn't like fall off the plane, but it unseated from the, uh, from the rim. Um, and (laughs) yeah, dude, that was was nuts. Oh man. Good stuff. So, so you, you did this air crew for the V22 Osprey for a total five years. Yeah. Did it for, did it five years on the day, actually. Like my, my contract started on the, uh, let's see on the third no started on the fourth and then i started my next contract with the army on the fourth five years later um which no kidding is freaking weird man like like i didn't so i went through the trouble of adjusting my eas with a conditional release mm. um went all the way to the headquarters of marine corps did all this like ridiculousness it took like seven months to get it and then i ended up actually just easing on my original eas like they, he was like, I could have done nothing and everything would have been the same. Like, yeah. So it was, it was weird. So, so you started in the Marine Corps and now you're in the army. Yeah. All right. So I want, I want to, I want to dive in pretty deep on like how, how this happens, how you, how you can do this, why you did this, um, you know, how you were able to kind of manipulate your EAS, you know, and, and, and how, how that transition kind of went forward. Yeah. Yeah, so I, so I, I, the reason I wanted to do a transfer from the Marine Corps to the Army was to do the warrant officer program, and what that is is like it's a it's a program where you to be a warrant officer you don't have to have a college degree, you just have to be you basically have to be smart enough and get a fight physical, and get people to recommend you for the job, and then you can you can go into that position. Uh, or you, you get put on a board and then you get selected to go to it. But to do all of that, you have to, um, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to finish, like to stop your contract that you're currently in and a leave basically to go to a different branch. And that's a conditional release. So you do a conditional release. And what that is, is like it's a three, six, eight. Um, and you have to send it up to at least in the marine corps you have to send it up to headquarters marine corps and the commandant he doesn't have to specifically but his cabinet has to sign off on you leaving the marine corps early Mm. and it's it is ridiculous how much like red tapes around it because it takes a long time um so for anybody who's doing it start it early like if, if you're like, Hey, I want to go do the one officer program. Um, and you're wondering about like things to start for your packet, stop everything, go to your S one, get a three, six, eight and start that process early. Cause it's like, it takes a long time for that thing yeah. to go through. Took how, me, how long, yeah, I was gonna say, how long did it take? So it took a year from the time I started to the time that I finished. It took me about three months cause my S one wasn't, they, yeah, they were not quite on top of the ball at the beginning but yeah. by the end we got a new s1 that guy was solid on point but the first guy he just didn't he didn't really like lean in and help me uh get it knocked out so a lot of it it's, it's kind of on you to, to make sure you're doing it right um which is frustrating because like all all of this stuff i i didn't have very many people to like hey how'd you do it a yeah. lot of it like hey you just have to figure it out and, and that's where a lot of the time comes in there was like three months of me just like making sure I got the form correctly filled out Mm -hmm. and like, Hey, did I do this right? You know, did I get this? So there's a lot of like small stuff that you had to kind of figure out on your own, which is really frustrating. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Most, most people that did that transition aren't, aren't there to ask about (laughs) how to to do it. Happy and often, often la la land, man. They made it. So, and that's that, like, that's the thing. Like uh, whenever I hear people now, like asking about it, I, I want to give them tons of information. Like yeah. if anyone now were to like, be like, Hey man, how'd you do it? I would literally sit down and just be like, Hey, 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 sure. hey 
come, come figure this out, dude. This is like really, this is it. Like, this yeah. is the one you want. Don't waste your time. I've got all the gold right here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, for sure. It's, yeah. But, um, so doing, doing the, the transition from the Marine Corps over to the Army, um, it's, it was about a year and a half of paperwork. Um, total. So it, it, just to give everybody kind of the, the big picture. So you were, you were flying in the Marine Corps as a crew chief which is mm-hmm. like an enlisted position. So you're not actually a pilot. Right. And at, at the point in time, you're making this decision, you're what, 22, 20, 23? Uh, I, yeah, 20. So I'm 24 right now. I was okay. planning, uh, I guess I'd, I started the process when I was 21. Yeah, t- 21 uh-huh. was when I like, was like, hey, I want to go do this warrant officer thing. And that's when I started putting feelers out. Um, okay. Like, hey, you know, talking to a warrant officer recruiter from my region and trying to get the ball rolling on that. So to, to fly and, and the reason, like the biggest reason from what I understand you were looking for the, the army warrant officer program is because in order to fly in the Marine Corps, you would have had to go to school, obtain a bachelor's degree, which would have taken yeah. a huge amount of time. Exactly. Yeah. But then you found this loophole of the warrant officer program, which basically allows you to fly without a bachelor's degree. Exactly. So yeah, you don't that's you pretty do awesome. not have to have a bachelor's degree to apply. And that's, this is the only, like the only program in the military that will allow you to get behind, like behind the controls of a military aircraft without a bachelor's degree is the warrant officer program. At 17, 18 years old, whenever you graduate high school, you could be eligible for this. You have, you have to be 18, but yeah, 18, you, can, okay. Okay. you can, you can get behind the, the, the seat. That's, that's uh, nuts. Yeah. It's that's dude, it, it is crazy. So like I'm going through right now, I'm like, I'm, I have a guy that I just went through candidate school with who's 19 and this guy, man, he's already like, I'm going to be flying with him. And like, it's just crazy to think like I could have done that from the get go. I didn't know about it though. Yeah. Uh, before I went through. So now that I'm, you know, now that I, I'm, I'm kind of on the other side of that and I'm, I've made it through the gate as it were um now i'm like man i i really want to let people know like a lot that's one of my biggest things now is like people who um like back in my old unit there's two guys right now who, who are still talking about it and i'm I'm trying to like oh really you know, crumb you know feed crumb like hey man it's, yeah. it's not that bad like just put in a package like it's yeah so especially yeah. right now man they're hurting they're hurting bad so yeah i mean i feel like the arm the army always has a bad rap i mean let's just be honest <laughs> so yeah. How do you feel about it so far after transitioning out of the, out of the Marine Corps to, to the Army? Like, is it really that big of a difference? No, no. I mean, I like so. Okay, so some of the subtle differences are the um, the structuring. Mm-hmm. So the the way that like the way that information is disseminated, the way that like you do normal like, uh, for instance, with the the barracks that we quarantine, and I wanna. I'll give it a little disclaimer. This is myself talking. This I have no affiliation. Like I'm not speaking on behalf of the army. Sure. This is, <laughs> get, get, yeah, there we go. Uh, so one of the ways that I, I felt like the Marine Corps just did a really good job. They, they really pushed responsibility down to the lowest level. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we have like uh, first sergeants and, uh, you know, CW threes, like chief warrant officer threes, doing like very mundane tasks around the schoolhouse that I was like, this is like, they shouldn't they have like a, a specialist or like a, you know, like a PFC or something like, you know, a private yeah. doing that job, like not a freaking first sergeant. Like, I don't know. So it just seemed like maybe understaffed or something like that, but it just, mm. so far I have just seen like the, the responsibility is not really pushed down to the lowest level. In the Marine Corps, that is one of the biggest things I would say is, it, and you can maybe speak on that too, of like, you're, you're put in charge of a lot as a Lance Corporal or yeah. as a Corporal. Like, there is a lot of weight put on that rank um, and a lot of, like, expectation for you yeah. to operate at that level. But whereas, like, in the Army, I haven't seen that quite yet. I don't know. I'm, and again, like, I'm in training, man. I don't know. Um, I bet you when I get out to a unit, it'll be like, okay, yeah, that's what I, that's what I thought it was going to be like, you know? Yeah. Um, but so far not too hot, but we'll see. I think, yeah. I think it'll pan out once we get to a real unit, it'll, it'll be good. Sure. Yeah. The fleet's always better, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> Good. So, all right. So you're, you're preparing for flight school now. Um, and you're, you're, you're on your way to being an army pilot. Yeah. So, um, was the transition, I mean, other than trying to figure out the proper steps and how to move forward, like, did it seem unrealistic at the time? And was it as hard as like, should, should people actually go for it? And if they're thinking about this, just, just do it. I mean, what, what kind of advice yes. would you give somebody who's yes, yes, <laughs> go for it. Like, I, I don't know. I, so I am, I would not put myself as like, to, to know a little bit about me, I am not the most intelligent or most well versed person in the entire world. I, I didn't do great through high school. Um, but I would say that I, I can think well on my feet and I have the ability to learn um, and I'm very teachable. And I yeah. think those are the big things that the army is looking for is people who are able to think in a high stress environment and are able to be teachable. And that's, that's really it. Um, like, and I, I say that, but like, yeah, you need to be able to physic be physically fit. You need to be able to yeah, pass yeah. by physical, but like the big thing is like putting yourself out there, being in a position of like, Hey, I, I can do that. Like, you know, it, I guess in some ways I can, I'm overlooking like five years of experience. Sure. Maybe. But even that, like looking at myself five years ago, I, I could do this job. Like, and, yeah. and someone coming out of high school, that's like, Hey, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll go to college or whatnot. Um, seriously look at it. Cause it's, it's really like, it's not as bad or as scary as I think people mm. put it out to be. There is tons of responsibility. Like, do not get me wrong. It is a very, very real environment. Yeah. Um, people's lives are at risk and, and your work definitely re relates to people staying alive. Mm. How well you hit those books means how well you'll be able to uh, operate and how well you're going to actually, you know, perform in a real environment. Yeah. So don't, you know, not that part of it, but like the actual, like, Hey, don't be afraid of it. Lean into it, you know? Mm. Um, be okay with putting in a little bit of work. Like, and that's really the biggest thing. It's like, you're going to put in work through flight school. Like th yeah. there's going to be a lot of, a lot of time spent because there's a lot of new information. Like anytime you learn something new, there's going to be a ton of like, Hey, I don't know. Like, I don't know what that is. So you just got to learn it. You got to put the time in. And I'm saying this on the front end of flight school, sure. um, but, <laughs> but from a lot of, a lot of time spent with talking with people who have already gone through it. Um, you know, it, it it's one of those programs that you just, you have to put in the time, you have to put in the work and on the, on the other end of it, uh, flight school doesn't stop, man. Like, and that's the big thing that a lot of people have been saying is like, Hey, even on the other, on the, once you finish flight school, that's not the end of training. Yeah. You will train your entire time in the military. And that's, you're never going to be the perfect pilot. You're never going to be the completely qualified pilot. Yeah. Uh, there's always something more to learn. There's always someone who, who knows something more about something than you do. And you got to, Hey, can you teach me about that? You know, um, but that's, I mean, that's the same with the real world and, you know, like feel like, Oh, let me, I can't wait to graduate college. Cause then I'll like, I've made it, you know, made it. Yeah. And, but the reality is you, you never make it. So, yeah. And that's the thing I think you should keep in mind coming into this is like, you're not, it's not a, I made it job. Yeah. Like, aviation in general, if you're in it for like, Oh, I want to be the top dog. And I've, you know, I know everything. This is not the right job, man. Like, mm. You, you need to be humble. You need to be in a position of like, Hey, always coming at it with like, Hey, I, you know, I might, I might be missing something. Uh, can you teach me about that? Or like, you know, you need to be, you need to stay humble and stay teachable. Cause that's the big, that's the big thing in aviation is, uh, something that I've seen personally is like those type of individuals who think they've made it and think they got it, like they get end up hurting people and that's, mm. um, and not in yeah. a good way, like, you know, like they ended up crashing planes and, and having mishaps. So that's the type yeah. of, environment you want to stay away from. So, but going, going back to like coming in, um, to anyone who is out there who, who, who'd be looking at this, that might be kind of afraid of the challenge. Don't be, it's not that bad. Like come in, put your nose to the grindstone. You can make it work. How do you feel like it's affected you? I mean, you know, like you, you pursued not only the Marine Corps initially, but now you've pursued the army, but wh how do you feel like it's impacted you, your character as you've grown up? I mean, do you oh, feel like you would have kind of ended up the same way with or without the military or? Uh, no, no. The military has stretched me a lot. Um, I think that I have, 
I've changed a lot since I first got in and, and in some good ways and in some bad ways. Um, I'd say like military culture, um, and I'll go with the bad first. Some of the military culture that I don't, uh, don't like is all of the, you know, the, the dirty jokes and the, you know, the, the all that other, yeah, yeah the, the junk that comes with uh, a lot of the people that come into the military. Um, yeah. But then some of the good stuff that I, I think that I've learned while I'm during my time in has been um, the responsibility um, that I've been put under and the, the standard that I've been held to. It's pushed me to be a better person and a better individual mm-hmm. um, that I don't think I would have had that same growth and the amount of time that I, you know, same amount of time, you know, um, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like responsibility uh, for me personally has grown so much faster in the military than I would have outside. Yeah. Um, that and just personal responsibility on keeping like taking care of yourself, um, you know, physical fitness, all of those things. I don't think I would have really put as much weight on it outside of the military. Um, but then when it's your day job and it's like, Hey, dude, that's, that's, that's part of like doing well at your job, like staying fit. Um, that helped as well. Um, some of the opportunities I think that I didn't have, like I wouldn't, I mean, flying on an, on an Osprey as your day job, like, I don't know that, like, I <laughs> think that that's, yeah, you know, like I had a really good time, um, during, during my time in the Marine Corps. And I, I think like the biggest thing out of it, I think I keep coming back to is just responsibility. I, I was held to a high standard. Uh, I was given a lot, lot to work with. And if you do well with it, you're going to progress. And mm. I don't know. Do you feel like you, you met a lot of resistance throughout your career thus far? Like, you know, resistance from leaders saying like, Oh no, you can't do that. Or, you know, that's not an option. That's not how this works. Yeah. But like, how, well, how do you deal with that resistance is, how do you tell when that's something like, yes, I should le- listen to the leadership that's telling me this yeah. and when you should keep digging and find. Push, maybe yeah. It, yeah. Cause so, it's, it's a fine line. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so I, <laughs> I had a, a gunny who was probably one of the most toxic leaders I've ever been around in the military in general. And he just happened to be my direct boss. Hmm. Um, and man, this guy would he, so yeah, it, it was really, really bad. Um, yeah, and tough. one of the things that I, I would say coming out of that, um, that I learned from personally, um, was like one of the ways that you can identify a bad leader or someone who's sitting there and is just a toxic leader, um, is when you're, when you have guys that are around you going to you for like, Hey, how did you progress? Like, how did you progress past this point? Um, and they're like, they're like, okay, well, I can't go talk to him about it. And we all know who he is yeah. you know, because he's going to shoot it down. How did you get around it? Cause I, I feel like I, I was kind of like a, in my group or in my shop, I was kind of like the, the odd guy or the odd ball out. Cause like, I just didn't, I didn't play by the rules when it came to, Hey, you can't go do that. Well, why not? Like, why can't I use TA right now? Like, yeah. Big Marine Corps says I can. Why can't I? Yeah. Like, is that a personal thing? Like, is that something you're, you're not letting me do? Or like, what do you mean? Like, so it, I, I don't know. I, I kind of rattled the box a little, or like mm-hmm. rattled the cage on like what's allowed. Yeah. Um, and uh, t- to be clear, it, you're not breaking rules. You're, you're, oh, you're fully no. aware of like what's okay and what's not. And sometimes. Yes. And that's leaders... the thing that a lot of people don't like is like yeah. when you, when you know what, what you're allotted or what you're allowed to do, when you yeah. know the publication, people hate when you're like, Hey, no, that is a personal problem that you have to deal with. Yeah. Big Marine Corps or big army says that I am allowed to do that. I'm going to go do it yeah. um, respectfully. Like, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to like put it in your face, but like, yeah. I'm going to do this. And I, mm-hmm. I apologize. It's not going to take away from my day job. I will continue to do what I need to do personally and professionally. Yeah. But I also need to do this personally. Like this is personal. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, and one of the like so back to like how you're going to identify that when when you can find things that you are allowed to do um big the big part about like pushing past that uh and making sure that you can do those things is knowing about them so make sure you know what you're allowed to do like get in the publications get in the you know 
uh, the regulations on, hey, what am I allotted? What is my crew rest? What is my, you know, yeah. know what is allowed. And mm-hmm. then that's, that's what you're bound by, not what someone, what some leader is telling you to do. Yeah. Um, they are bound by that just as much as you are. So I don't know. I think with toxic leaders, they're out there and they're going to continue to be out there. Um, what you can do is know your stuff and just eventually they're going to move on like that. And that was a big thing. Like the guy ended up leaving, like, you know, it's, they're going to move on. Like it, it's going to suck during your time underneath them, but always learn from it. Cause like my biggest thing, I am never going to be that toxic leader. Like yeah. I learned what that toxic, you know, like I, I really got a big taste of it and was like, dude, that tastes like shit. Like it tastes really bad. Like that sucks. Yeah. You know? Like you, and once you taste it, then you never want to give it out again. Like you never want to deal that, that type of leadership again. You're just, it's so off putting that you're just like, no, I'm never going to do that. Yeah. And it's so. interesting that, that people that experience a leader like that, they either turn out just like that or the, ent- the complete opposite, you know? And so like, yeah. You dealt and, with that. And you're like, I'm never going to be like that. And I will make a point to never be like that. And then people are like, you yeah. know, I, I was treated like this. I got to get back at the, the next people. You know? Dude, that is crazy. Like, if I could, if I could, no, that right there, if I could pin the Marine Corps, it would be, man, my time sucked in the Marine Corps. So I'm going to make your time in the Marine Corps suck. And it's like, <laughs> oh, like, come that on. That doesn't like, make sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, at least like during my time at that, at that specific unit, that's what it was like. So I yeah. just, so as, as long as you're educated on the opportunities that you want to, you want to pursue and you know that they're fully within the, the bounds and rules, then, uh, yeah. And be good at your job. Like yeah. that's the other thing. Don't give them ammo, man. Don't mm-hmm. give whoever bad leader, like don't give them ammo to be on your bad side or like, you know, like if, if you want to go do something, be good at your job, be good at your job. And like, that's, that's the number one step. When people like show up to their first day, your number one job is not, Hey, what are all my benefits? Like, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That be like a six months or like seven, eight, you know, a year later, maybe Yeah. Uh, potentially be good at your job. And then you have a leg to stand on. Uh, when you get that leg to stand on, then it's like, Hey, I want to go do this. I need a life outside of work. All right. Yeah. Uh, that's when you can start, you know, Hey, really pinning it to the guy if they're not letting you do stuff. That's, that is, that's, that's a very good advice right there. Cause yeah, the, the people that show up, they never really make the effort to become proficient at what they're paid to do. Nobody's going to come back for you when it's time that you want something like nobody. <laughs> so not only in the military, but in, in the real world too. So yeah, yep. that, that's sound advice, but uh, awesome, man. Well, I mean, I know you just gave a lot of like tips of like, you know, advice for those people in but if if somebody's looking uh into the joining the military maybe they're like you know nearing the end of high school or even college and thinking about like is this worth it should i pursue this uh you know what would you tell them how what kind of what kind of path would you set them on um i and i i would say like what do you want to do And for those guys out there that don't know what they want to do, think about what, like, what's the big picture? Why would you join the military instead of go to college? What's the thing about the military that like is attractive? What's the, like, is it the, the travel? Is it the, you know, education benefits? Like what, what, what's that thing? And then tailor it to the branch that you want to go into. Um, Cause like, I, I can tell you right now, if you're looking for just education benefits and an easy four, four year ride, go to the air force, like find a way to yeah. get in the air. Force, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you're, if you're looking to make a difference and actually deploy and get out there right now, go to the Marine Corps. Like they're get on a mu man. Like those, those guys are getting out there and still doing stuff. Um, if you're, if you're looking to, to, to make it out and, and do like a good trade job, the army is a really good place. The, the Coast Guard, one of the guys that I went through school uh, here is a, is a Coast Guard guy. And man, he's just, he, he had nothing but great things to say about the, the Coast Guard on, mm. on trade jobs. They're really big on, hey, we're not just going to teach you how to do a job. We're going to civilian qualify you on that job as well. So he got his AMP. The Marine Corps didn't give me an AMP. Uh, they gave him an AMP and we did the same exact job. No kidding. Uh, yeah. 
So they went – so, dude, Coast Guard, if you can get in, it's, it was pretty tight. You, you got you to really know your stuff and be a good candidate for it. But um, the Coast Guard is a good place to go. Huh. Um, but, yeah, I, I would just say for people going in, know what you want to do and then, and then do the research. Get in and actually, like, like what I did, uh, I did my research before I went in to go look at a contract. And then when you show up, hey, I want to do an air crew candidate. I want to be an air crew candidate and then they can be like no we you know we don't have any spots or yeah we have a spot for you like come over here and take a look you know so yeah yeah do your research prior to showing up um because at the end of the day man they're they're trying it's probably some poor staff sergeant who's there who's just trying to get a quota <laughs> for the month man like think about their job like at the end of the day there was recruiters they have a job to do and their job is to sell a job and that's that, that's yeah. the end of it so like make sure you do your research prior to showing up um, and know what you want um, prior to getting there because they'll sell you, man. They're good. They're good salesmen. Yeah, that's true. It, yeah. If you don't know what you want, then they can sell you in anything, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah. It, if you, if you have an idea of what you want and what you're going there for, uh, you're, ma- I don't want to say you're making their job harder, but you are there. You're not going to sign any old contract if you know what you want. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that advice. Awesome. Yeah. And if you want to fly one officer program, street to seat, yeah, look look into that. If you're listening to this and you have the chance to do the, the street to seat thing and you Is fall, that the name of the program? Street yeah. Street to Seat? Army Street to Seat. Uh, just it, literally if you Google search Army Street to Seat one officer program, uh, it, it'll pop up. Um, Quickest and path to flying. Dude, oh my gosh. Like you can be an eighteen year old if you're qualified, yeah. you can be an eighteen year old kid waiting to go through flight school like, crazy dude it's nuts. crazy yeah. yeah yeah so if, if i had known about that i don't know if i'd have been mature enough to be going through flight school at 18 but if i was that's man i wish i was doing that you know yeah that's awesome man yeah i appreciate you sharing your experience your story and uh joining me yeah for sure thanks man